Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists with me, Chris Smith, and also with Helen Scales. Hello, Helen. Hello. Now, in this week's show, how scientists have found a better way to conquer allergies, like hay fever, and that's using a short course of injections, so a piece of research not to be sniffed at. Also, you've heard of music for your ears, or music to your ears, but what about music for your heart? Scientists have found that certain types of music can be better for you than others, and we'll be hearing what they are. And also, researchers have uncovered what controls the way that certain things taste, and you're not going to like it. But under certain circumstances, it's all down to the bacteria that live in your mouth. Yum. And on that tasty note, Helen. Thanks, Chris. Also, this week we're looking at how science is helping archaeologists to dig into the past. We'll be hearing how scientists have found out a bit more about what went on when Stonehenge was first built and what the DNA of animals and crops is telling scientists about how humans domesticated plants and livestock. We'll also be delving into the fate of the people who made the Nazca Lines. Now, these are huge markings carved into the desert in South America over a 1,000 years ago. But what happened to the people who made them and then disappeared? Well, scientists now have uncovered some clues and we'll be finding out what they were and what they thought went on a bit later on in the show. Chris. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, Ben and Dave are also sticking with our historical theme this week with their kitchen science because they've built for us a medieval siege weapon. I'm going to stand back. Dave's going to let go, I think, and we'll see how far it flies. When you're ready, Dave. OK, here we go. That's incredible. They'll be explaining in just a second how you can make your very own trebuchet and also how it works in just a moment. So in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with the programme, the email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.net. Now, for people like me who suffer from allergies, annoying as they are, hay fever, asthma, food allergies... Often the only way to deal with them is to take drugs like antihistamines that can make the symptoms better. They don't actually make the problem go away. But now researchers have come up with a better way to desensitise people. In other words, to make the immune system tolerate better the thing that they're reacting to. This is Gabriella Senti and her colleagues. They're at the University Hospital in Zurich. And they've pioneered an approach in which you inject people with allergen not into the skin, but into the lymph nodes, the glands. Now, in the past, when doctors have tried to desensitise patients, they've made a weak solution of the thing that the person is allergic to and then injected this into the skin. And over a course of several years of doing this, eventually, in some people, the body learns to tolerate the thing you're injecting. But it's not without risk because the skin is all tooled up to tackle allergen like this and often you get very profound and pronounced reactions. And this includes anaphylaxis, which can be life-threatening. So this group of researchers thought, well, if we inject instead the allergen directly into the lymph nodes, that's where the cells are that can reprogram the immune system and re-educate immunity in order to better tolerate allergen. So instead of having to give the allergen to the skin where you get a vigorous reaction, if we inject it into lymph nodes, it might be better. So they recruited 183 people who had hay fever. They divided them into two groups. Group one just got skin injections. This went on for three years and they had 54 injections of the thing they were allergic to into the skin. The other group got just three injections, one month apart, into lymph nodes, glands in their groin, which you can find very easily just by palpation or by using ultrasound to spot them. The results at three-year follow-up were really, really impressive. The people who had the lymph node injections, after just three injections, they began to show dramatic improvements in their symptoms, and that effect persisted for the three years of the study. They had far fewer side effects. That meant they needed to take less antihistamines. They needed to be admitted to hospital less often with reactions like anaphylaxis. And also, because the response was much quicker, they all improved in symptoms much sooner. And they also reported that it was less uncomfortable. It's less painful being injected in your lymph nodes than it is into your skin so they're saying this is a very good way to control the immune response and to drive a re-education of immunity by injecting people with the thing they're allergic to and to do it in a much safer way is that what we're going to see happening is it simply a case of redirecting those needles to a different part of the body and we can do that very quickly if it's the same thing that they're using This is published this week in the journal PNAS, so you can have a read about it. But yes, what they're saying is this is an initial trial. We need to do this a bit more in order to assess what happens if you do this to bigger groups of people and perhaps look at other allergies as well, because obviously they've looked at hay fever. What about other kinds of allergies? Will the same trick work? But I think more trials are going to be needed. But the difference is that 
we know where these lymph nodes are. We know how to do these reactions and how to do these injections. And it's already licensed for injection into the skin. So I don't think there's much of a, a, a translation problem. We're doing it instead into a lymph node instead of in the skin. So I think there's every reason to be optimistic. I think we'll be seeing this quite soon. Fantastic. Well, from helping us deal with our allergies to making our hearts feel a lot better as well. And that may come down to listening to your favourite music. Well, we all know that feel-good music puts us in a great mood, but it could also be good for our hearts. Researchers from the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore in the US have shown that for the first time the emotions associated with listening to joyous music has a beneficial effect on blood vessels leading to improved blood flow in a similar way that laughter has already been shown to be good for us. And this study was presented at the scientific sessions of the American Heart Association in New Orleans this week. And it essentially involved 10 healthy volunteers who were tested for four, with four different types of music that they were played for half an hour at a time. And uh, for one of these music uh, types of music, the volunteers were asked to bring along recordings of the mu- music that they really liked and that they made them feel happy. And apparently, um, most of them chose country music. So I think that um, really just reflects on where this study was done. Um, they were also played music that they didn't like and that made them feel very anxious and apparently for most of the these uh, experimental subjects that was heavy metal music um, and thirdly they were played music designed to be relaxing so I assume that was some sort of waves or whale music or something uh, and a fourth session um, they were actually played videotapes which were um, comedy shows that were intended to make them have a giggle um, now to measure the effect of music on blood vessels the researchers measured something called flow mediated dilation now essentially that determines how the lining of the blood cells called the endothelium actually responds to different stimuli and that includes things like emotions as well as medicines and exercise, things like that. And it essentially is looking at how well blood is being delivered to the tissues. Now, to measure um, flow-mediated dilation involves essentially restricting blood flow briefly along an artery in the upper arm using a cuff, so sort of holding the blood vessel down, then releasing it and using ultrasound, you can measure how much the blood um, vessels respond, whether they increase in size or decrease, and you can get a percentage um, measurement out of that. Um, So the researchers then basically looked at this, um, played the music, saw what effect it had on their blood vessels, and they found that when they were listening to the happy, joyous music, their blood vessels expanded by, on average, 26%. Um, And a similar but smaller effect happened when they listened to the relaxing music. But the opposite happened when they were played the unhappy, anxiety-inducing music, when their blood vessels actually constricted by around 6%. Now, the interesting point here is that um, when they watched the funny videos, the same effect of expansion in the blood vessels also happened, but to a lesser extent, only to around 19% of an expansion in the blood vessels when they were having a laugh. Or maybe they weren't. I'm kind of interested to know if the subjects actually did laugh because we we all laugh at different things don't we you know we're not all the same um but you know bottom line is well why is this happening do we have any idea that's actually still quite a mystery the sort of link between our brains and our bodies is part of the human biology that's still very unknown um it could well be something to do with endorphins those um happy chemicals in the brain um and it certainly isn't the case that country music is going to work for all of us it'll be more the case that um it'll be the particular music that you like but maybe you know just the good piece of news is spend a bit of your day listening to some of your favorite music and uh, it might be good for you so just do it why not (laughs) I think it's quite telling that the people who got the Ig Nobel Prize for Medicine a few years ago, Helen, got it for showing that it, if you play someone or, or that suicide rates were correlated with radio stations playing a lot of country music. So where radio stations in the States, this research was done, where they played a lot more country music, the suicide rate was a lot higher. So um, it may have be beneficial to your heart, but it might not be good for your mood in the long term. Who knows? Now, also uh, this week, scientists have discovered that part of what we call taste may actually be down to the bacteria that live in our mouths. Now, this stems from a conundrum that's been revolving around the drink Sauvignon. So, in other words, the grape Sauvignon that's used to make wines like Sauvignon Blanc for a little while. There was a French enologist, a wine expert, called Émile Penel, who published a book in the 1990s in which he drew attention to the fact that you get this burst of fruity flavour from a sip of Sauvignon after it's slipped down your throat. So, in other words, even after you've swallowed the wine, about 30 seconds later you then get this so-called retro aroma you get this second taste and no one actually knew exactly where it was coming from but now scientists uh, including Christian Starkenman who's a researcher at Fermanich in Switzerland that's a flavour company they've published a paper this week in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry if you want to look it up Um, what they've actually shown is why this happens and it turns out that it's all down to the bacteria in your mouth metabolising things that are in the wine now in the wine, there are flavour compounds which are odourless. 
So if you just sniff them, you can't tell that they're there. And they're based on sulfur. They're things called cysteine S conjugates. So they're, they don't volatilize. They don't evaporate in your mouth and go into your nose. So you can't smell them. But if you take saliva from volunteers, as these guys did, take the saliva and put it into two, break it into two halves. Half the sample you pasteurize. So you heat it to 60 degrees to get rid of any bacteria that are in it. The other half you keep pristine. If you then add the sulfur compounds to the two specimens and then ask people to sniff them, you find that only in the saliva sample that has not been pasteurized does the effect, the ability to produce this nice smell, continue. In the pasteurized saliva, it completely goes away. And this told the researchers there must be something alive, something microbial perhaps in the saliva, which is having this effect. So they cultured bacteria from the saliva and they grew one kind of bacteria, an anaerobe, in other words, a bacterium that hates oxygen, called Fusobacterium nucleatum. And when they added this bacterium to some mineral water with some of these other sulfur compounds, they were able to recreate the effect of the Sauvignon Blanc swishing around your mouth. So this shows that probably when you take a, a bite of certain fruits, when you drink glasses of wine like this, or certain other chem um, compounds like um, bell peppers make a very nice, similar, flavorous burst in your mouth, um, when you eat these foods, probably what happens is that some of these odorless sulfur compounds get broken down by bacteria in your mouth. That takes a little while, so then you get this burst of flavor after you've swallowed, and that's where it comes from. It's all down to the bugs that you've got in your mouth. Do we all have the same bugs? Because I imagine that maybe some of us have different types of bugs in our mouth. I know some people are more prone to certain sort of um, conditions like gum disease, I think maybe are, are linked to that sort of thing. So are there people who are, have more of a fruit burst in their mouth than others, do you think, perhaps? It could account for the fact that there are different tastes and flavours amongst different people and also preferences for certain foods tend to run in families and you acquire the bacteria that you have in and on your body from your parents because of kissing and the way you're born and also breastfeeding and things. So it could be that, uh, in fact, tastes are down to the bugs that you have in your mouth. To a certain extent, that's given to you from your parents, and this affects how you experience different foods. And also, because those profiles do change slightly, it could account for the fact that different people like different things. Well, there you go. Now, while the world headlines are still full of the news that the Americans have elected Barack Obama as their first African-American president, there is also news this week of how members of the fish world elect their leaders. But when it comes to deciding which leader to back, most of the time fish reach a consensus to go for the most attractive of two possible leaders. But like stereotypical sheep following the flock, fish will also follow whatever choice most of the rest of their shoal take, whether or not it's the right choice or not. Now, this is a study from a team of researchers led by David Sumter from Uppsala University in Sweden and Ashley Ward from Sydney University in Australia, and they published this in the, this week in the journal Current Biology. Now, they conducted experiments in aquariums with little freshwater fish called three-spined sticklebacks. And from previous studies, they already knew that these fish had certain preferences for particular leader fish, and they were ones that were just generally fitter, bigger, plumper, and that haven't got spots that might indicate that they have a parasitic infection. Now, what the researchers wanted to know was whether a shoal of fish as a gr um, come to a decision as a group on which leader to back and whether that's by consensus. In other words, do they make decisions that reflect the general opinion of the whole group? Now, a similar thing actually happens in people when we're asked to sit on a jury in court. It was actually a, an 18th century French philosopher, Condorcet, who showed that as the size of a jury increases, so does the chance that the group will correctly decide if the defendant is guilty or not. But how do they know the, the defendant is guilty or not? Well, OK. I mean... <laughs> Now, that's just being difficult, but this is the same sort of thing that goes on in fish, and it's much easier to see in fish because um, they're essentially going for bit fish that are or are not attractive based on whether they're big, small, skinny and spotty and so on. And that's what Sumter and Ward did. They made replica fish re representing different levels of attractiveness, um, which we already knew um, that they do generally prefer. And put quite simply, the groups um, of fish checked out two possible leaders um, in the tanks and swam towards the one that they chose. Um, and the researchers saw that as the size of the shoal of fish increased, the fish got better and better at accurately choosing the better leader which was the one that actually was bigger, better fed and so on. Um, while the consensus group was most accurate, most of the time they were mostly accurate, occasionally the shoal would slip up and make the wrong decision and actually swim towards the smaller, less attractive leader. But 
who can blame the stickleback? Since us humans, we do make mistakes as well, but we generally follow what everyone else around us is doing, whether or not that's always the right thing to do. And it can, of course, lead to stock market crashes as well if you subscribe to those sorts of values. Thanks, Helen. It is The Naked Scientist with Chris and Helen, and we're talking shortly about the science of archaeology and what archaeology can tell us about what happened in the past, of course. And we'll be talking with Preston Miracle. He's at Cambridge University, and he's an expert on what we used to eat and what bones can tell us about how we used to rear animals. We'll also be finding out about the plants that we used to grow and we grow today and how we can interrogate the genetics of plants to inform our, inform, or inform us about that. Martin Jones will be here to talk about that. And also what really went on at Stonehenge. We'll be finding out what strontium isotope analysis of some of the bones that have been found at Stonehenge is revealing. Distilling the best science. The Naked Scientists. It's The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales. And don't forget, we're also live on Second Life. So hello to everyone in Second Life. If you'd like to join in with a bunch of people who listen to us in Second Life, you go to Second Life on the internet and you go to the Scilands, S-C-I-L-A-N-D-S, and then if you find The Naked Scientist mansion, you'll see the assembled crowd there listening to us. So hello to all of you. We're watching you. Helen. Still to come, we'll be finding out how animal bones, plant DNA and strontium isotopes can tell us all about our ancestors. But one sad fact that we already know that is that throughout history, people have come up with increasingly ingenious ways to attack each other. But rather than asking, well, can we all just get along, Ben and Dave have decided to build a scale model of a medieval siege weapon to see how it works. I'm really excited with this week's Kitchen Science because Dave has told me he's going to show me how to build some desktop siege weapons just like they used for medieval sieges. Dave, what are we building? This sounds great. We're going to build a medieval catapult called a trebuchet out of a few bits of cardboard, a mug, some string and a pen. This sounds fantastic. Is it going to be dangerous, though? Is this something people can try out at home? On the scale we're doing, you can certainly try this at home, although I wouldn't try and build a full-size one without some serious training. So we're making a little one. I'm guessing in the medieval period they used bigger ones. Yeah, they used to build huge ones for knocking down castle walls. They could throw a 300-kilogram ball of rock up to 300 metres and keep hitting the same place again and again and again until the wall fell down. OK, well, as long as nobody tries that at home, how should they build themselves a desktop trebuchet? Well, basically, a trebuchet works very similar to a seesaw. I don't know if you ever sat on one end of a seesaw when there was someone much lighter on the other end. Um, Pretty much every time I sat on a seesaw, I found that was the situation. Yes, Dave. And then they shot up in the air. (laughs) They did, and I just stayed on the ground. Oh, sorry, Ben. (laughs) Okay, so the first thing we're going to make is the arm of the seesaw. So I've got a piece of cardboard about 20 centimetres long and about five or six centimetres wide. I'm now going to fold that into a U-shape, so put two folds, a bit more than a centimetre apart, along the middle, so you get a U-shaped cross-section. So we've got a sort of cardboard trough that's about a centimetre wide. Yeah, that's right, and about two centimetres deep. And then we're going to put the pivot for the seesaw much closer to one end than the other, maybe about four centimetres away from one end. OK, and for a pivot, you're just using a plastic biro and just pushing it through the cardboard? Yeah, that's right, it's really easy. And to save weight, what you can do is trim the cardboard away from the two ends, so it's sort of approximately triangular, coming up to the pivot, so it's widest at the pivot, and going down again at each side. Now, the next thing we need, of course, for our siege weapon is a projectile. Right, so this is where we choose our real weapon. So what are we going to fling at people, Dave? Well, basically, you want something which is quite light, not going to do very much damage, and you want a way of tying a piece of string to it. So... I thought a pen lid would be quite good for this, and it's a pen lid with a little hook on it to clip onto your pocket. Um, And what I'm going to do is take a piece of string, tie a loop in one end, a knot in the other one, and then just feed that knot in under that clip. So I've got a string attached to the pen lid. Fantastic. So it is just a pen lid, so it should be quite light and not too dangerous. And it now has a piece of string attached to it with a small loop on the other end, about five or six centimetres long. I'm guessing the string is to attach the pen lid onto the seesaw arm of the trebuchet. Yeah, that's right. We now need a way to attach it and a way which will let go at the right point of the swing. So what we're going to do is get a piece of wire. I've got one of those little ties which you can use to tie up plastic bags. And I'm going to make a hole with a pen at the other end, at the narrow end of the seesaw arm. So this is the end furthest from the pivot. We're just putting a small hole through the middle of the cardboard. Yeah, that's right. And then I'm going to feed this tie through that hole. I see, so it's making a hook shape on that end of the pivot and we can use this hook to attach the string that has our projectile on it. Yeah, that's right. Um, You might want to do some careful bending of the hook so it doesn't fall out 
and you'll probably have to do some research and development work to get the right angle of the hook. Well, obviously, when building a desktop weapon, we're going to need to tweak to make sure it's as powerful as possible. So we now have our cardboard seesaw arm with a pen stuffed through one end to act as a pivot and a little hook on the other end onto which we can attach our projectile. What else do we need to build a working weapon? Well, what we need is something to take your place on the seesaw. So we need something much heavier than our projectile. I think a mug's quite a good weight for this. It's something people are likely to have at home or in an office, so this is just a normal coffee cup. But I can see you've tied a bit of string onto the handle. Do we need that? We need some way of attaching it to the short end of the trebuchet arm, and a piece of string is the easiest way of doing that, really. OK, so now we have our weight, in our case a cup, but I guess people could use anything that they can tie a piece of string to. And that's tied on the short end of our trebuchet, opposite the end, which has our little metal hook for attaching our projectile. So we must be nearly done now, Dave. You've run out of stuff to play with. Indeed. Um, if you're feeling very sophisticated, you can build a frame to hold it up in the air, or you can just balance a pivot between your two hands. And this is nearly ready to fire, so we'll put it in its stand and we'll attach the projectile to the other end. But how do you actually arm this for firing? Well, basically, you take the loop of the piece of string attached to your projectile, put it over the hook, pull the projectile down as far as it will go. And that lifts up the cup, our weight. Yep, that's right. And then just let go. So with the cup end raised as high as it can be and the projectile pulled as low as it can be, I think I can see how this is going to work. But we will come back later on in the show, do a test fire and see quite how good our desktop siege weapon really is. So we will be back later with them to see how good the trebuchet is. And if you want to have a go at making one, it's really simple. And Dave has put the instructions on our website, so go and have a look now. It's www.thenakedscientist.com forward slash kitchen science. Thank you, Helen. And I've just heard from Robin in Northampton. Something they did a lot in medieval times was drink a lot of beer. And he wonders why, when someone drinks beer after having food with a lot of salt in it, why does the beer seem to go flat quicker? Well, Robin, it's all down to something called nucleation. And that is that the salt in the, in the drink, the little crystals, if you've got some of those stuck on your lips or still in your mouth, although it's unlikely with saliva around, the salt forms a rough surface for the beer bubbles, the carbon dioxide that makes beer fizzy, to form on because it's much easier to form where there's a little imperfection. So the beer fizzes out and all the carbon dioxide gets released where the salt crystals are and that makes the beer go flat. And you can demonstrate this for yourself if you take a bit of beer and pour some salt into the beer and it should all froth up and that's the CO2 coming out. Stripping down science. (coughs) The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales. And this week we're talking about the science of archaeology and we have with us Preston Miracle and Professor Martin Jones. And they're both from the Department of Archaeology at Cambridge University. They both work on something that's vitally important to every animal on Earth and certainly it would have been vital to our ancestors and that's the issue of food. What do we eat and where does our food actually come from? Well, shortly we'll be talking to Martin about um, uh, plant genetics and what that can teach us about farming and how that first came about and how it spread. But long before anyone had settled down to tend the land, hunting animals was a very important source of food. And we have with us Preston Miracle. Hi, Preston. Thanks for coming into the studio. My pleasure. Um, First of all, um, what sort of thing can we learn from the old remains of animal bones that are are left behind? And what can it tell us about what people ate? Well, the first uh, trick, of course, is to sort out what uh, animals the bones are coming from. And for that, we've got uh, various kinds of comparative collections. So you can compare the old to the new and sort out the species, uh, the age of the animal, perhaps, uh, which part of it uh, was preserved and and, and the like. Uh, But uh, moving on from that, and um, in my own interest as a zoo archaeologist, an archaeologist studying these, these zoological remains, it's really looking at the patterns of modification, say, from butchery or... Um, uh, you know, the kinds of, of, of damage from, from, from hunting and cooking that you might have, but also looking at the other animals that might have been using and collecting these animals and trying to unravel, uh, say, from uh, Ice Age caves, which animals and, and, and which people, uh, for that matter, would have been using these, these animals and bringing them into the site. And uh, were these animals that are still alive today or were they are we looking at things that are actually long gone and extinct and would we be quite surprised to see strolling around um, our countryside today well of course the farther back you go in time uh, the more of the extinct animals that you have uh, a, a lot of my 
work recently has been looking at remains of about 130,000 years ago uh, at the time of the last interglacial period, so the last warm period, much like our own. Um, and in these cases, from uh, a site in northern Croatia, the site of Krapina, we have evidence of very large woodland rhinos um, that have, have long been extinct that these Neanderthals were clearly hunting, as well as um, large bison, uh, cave bears, um, beavers, a whole, a whole suite of uh, different animal rains that were coming into these, into these sites. And I have to ask, but I know that it's quite controversial and there are people arguing maybe both ways, but how do you feel about how much those um, ancestral uh, people, uh, our ancestors, were maybe contributing to the demise of those species that are no longer with us? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to find direct evidence of, of, of just what happened to the Neanderthals. And, and for that particular issue, we're, of course, talking about something that happened about 30,000 years ago, so, so much later in time than, than the particular site I was talking about. Um, my, my, my guess is that there is a, a fair amount of, of out-competition by these new peoples. But um, I think we can see from the ways in which the Neanderthals were managing the food and the ways in which they were hunting different kinds of animals that they were extremely competent um, hunters. And, and certainly in terms of their kinds of adaptations to the environment were in, very, in many ways very successful to these, to these Ice Age environments. So looking at the hunting now, um, how do we know, how can we reconstruct, um, what do we find um, in this sort of um, archaeological record that tells us about how our own ancestors um, were, went out hunting and what they actually used, the techniques they used? Well, one question that one faces is, you know, were they hunting these animals as opposed to, say, just uh, picking up uh, dead carcasses, scavenging them, of course? And um, there are several lines of evidence one can look at. One is to look at what age of animal they were taking. So are they uh, producing uh, a structure of, say, very young and relatively old animals, which is what you would expect to be finding on the landscape itself if you were scavenging? Or as we can see, again, from uh, not just the site of Krapina, but many of these Neanderthal sites, that they were actually targeting animals in their prime of life. And so that's a very good sign that, that somebody was you know, actively taking these animals rather than just collecting the carcasses. When you get to the animals themselves, if you look at the pattern of, of were they taking meatier parts of the carcass, were they, um, again, processing these, these, these meaty remains, it's, again, a very good indication that you had some kind, of, some kind of hunting as opposed to scavenging going on. And what kind of tools were they using? Well, what we have preserved is, for the most part, the, uh, the stone tools. Um, some of these would have been serving as perhaps some kind of points on thrust spears, um, various tools for, for, say, cutting into the hide and cutting up the meat. Um, many of these tools were most certainly used for making wooden tools, um, and unfortunately we very, very rarely have the remains of these wooden tools preserved. And uh, were they good at butchering? Had they, uh, uh, all that time ago, they figured out um, how to deal with these animals? Do we have any, any, any evidence of, um, of skilled um, stonework? Um, well, I, I've, I think quite clearly so. You can see that they were... Um, making a, a detailed use of the animal's anatomy to cut, uh, say, these rhino carcasses up into smaller packets for transport. And, and there's a pattern of, of burning on the bones. You get burning on the very ends of them, for example, that suggests that these might have been um, roasted on the open fire. Um, so, yes, I think, I think these were very competent in terms of their manipulation of these, of these carcasses. So we do know that they did cook the food, because I think we're talking about that a bit later on today in the show, is whether or not we actually have to cook our food. But do, do we generally find that cooking the meat was something um, that's been around for a very long time? I, I would think so. The evidence is, is fairly, um, fairly ephemeral for these time periods. And cooking is one of the, one of the real frontiers, I think, that we still are, are, are approaching and trying to get a better understanding of. But again, patterns of this kind of burning um, on the bones, to me, is, is very suggestive of some kind of, some kind of roasting and cooking. Thanks, Preston. And uh, of course, one of the other things that uh, is very important to food is plant sources. And one of the things that we see commonplace today are domesticated crops. We grow them in fields and then we harvest them and we eat them. But was that always the case? Well, Martin Jones is also with us from Cambridge University. Welcome, Martin. Hello. Um, tell us about, about when people first began to domesticate plants. 
Well, we, uh, we've been eating grass seeds, and let's remember that things like cereals are actually just big grass seeds. We've been eating them for a, a, at least 25,000 years. How do you know that? Um, there's a, there are some sites, for example, a site on the Sea of Galilee, uh, which captured the remains of wild barley seeds um, alongside a whole range of other things, of fish, birds, and all the things they ate. Um, and uh, they were found on the fire. And in addition... Uh, that site um, on the Sea of Galilee had grinding stones and in the cracks of the stones were small bits of silica that under a microscope we can identify as coming from grass seeds. So our history, our our relationship with plants goes back a long time. We've got that documented, but it's a bit different to just go gathering plants than to physically grow them with the purpose of eating them or using them. So when do we think that happened? We can see that something big happens to the form of the plants around 10,000 years ago. And between uh, 9 and 10,000 years ago, in different parts of the world, um, in uh, Southwest Asia, but also in parts of China, you can see um, plants changing their form, and they're changing their form in such a way as they need the farmer to sow them. And that's the, that's the threshold that, we're, that we think of as domestication, when the plant can no longer uh, survive in the wild. It's become dependent on the farmer to sow it. And this would have been because people were selecting breeds of plants that gave them very good yields, but obviously the payback for the, the farm was the yield, but the payback for the plant was it, it needed to be nurtured. Well, you can see it that way. I mean, I think um, also it's the plant evolving. So the plant is, in a sense, um, uh, going for for an option that is good for the plant. It's the plant that's evolving rather than the humans. And what we can see is there's enough human predators uh, doing certain things for the plant to switch that way. I think we're thinking of these evolutionary processes as as as, as two sided. That both the humans and the plants are evolving together. So that would put the the first farmers around 10,000 years ago. Mm. What sorts of crops would they have grown? They'd have grown crops that were slightly familiar to us. They'd have grown uh, wheat and barley. They wouldn't be the same wheat as we have in our bread today. In fact, the types of wheat, the species of wheat that they were growing are now quite rare. They have names like einkorn and emma, and there are just very few places, normally hilly places where crop salesmen don't get to, in uh, Europe and Africa, where you can find um, uh, them still growing. And in China, they would be rice and and millet. Millet, we're most familiar as as bird seed, but in fact, a lot of people still uh, eat millet in in North China. And if you look at the the genetic history of the plant, what can the DNA in the plants tell you about these various transitions, and how would you go about interrogating the plant's genetic material to find out when these things happened? Well, we're finding the answer to that question is changing every year because genetics is changing so fast. And uh, what we know now is that the DNA in the plant has a massive amount of historical information um, about what's happened to it, and that comes in two forms. On the one hand, there's a lot of DNA that doesn't seem to be doing much except slowly evolving, and that acts rather like the tachometer in a, in a lorry, that it, it, it traces a record of the journey the crop's taken through time. So some DNA you can tr- treat as a, as, as a marker of the journey and you can trace back the family tree of, of the plant and where it spread to and where it started from. But also um, the actual genes, the DNA that's making bits of the plant, we're beginning to realise that that can tell us a lot too. And the reason is that as the plant agriculture spreads around the world, it spreads into different environments and those genes have to change accordingly. And also when people moved, they presumably, if they had a good yielding crop, they would have taken some of that with them. So that presumably can tell you a bit about not just where the plants went, but where the people went too. Absolutely. In fact, um, now because um, genetics has affected every um, branch of archaeology, um, you can have a a group of different geneticists. You can have one looking at the human genes and forming maps and journeys of spread. You can have another geneticist looking at the crop genes and, and doing a map of the spread there. And you can have a third set of geneticists who are looking at the disease genes and they're all tracking the same um, pathways, which are the pathways of our human past. And what does this tell us about the way that humans got around the Earth and, and 
what impact do these changes you see in the plants have on what we understand about early human population civilizations and, and people getting together in communities? Well, one thing to, to bear in mind is, is that uh, humans were getting around the Earth before domestication uh, happened. And so on the one hand, you can, you can see humans going to the northerly latitudes uh, some, way before agriculture. So by, um, by thirty to 40,000 years ago, there are humans in the Arctic Circle. And that does say something about how they were interacting with animals and plants. Um, you can see also uh, farmers getting into the Arctic Circle. For example, you, we've done some work with barley, and, and that has shown the similar picture. Thank you, Martin. That's Professor Martin Jones, who is from the University of Cambridge. And before him, Dr Preston Miracle, who also works at the University of Cambridge and was looking at how we can find out what our ancestors did and ate by looking at the bones that we left behind. Helen. Well, we find out a lot about people in the past from their food, but we can also find out things from bones and teeth. And Dr Jane Evans from the Geological Survey in Nottingham has been looking at a site near Stonehenge and looking at not just how it was built and things like that, but the people who were there. And it seems that they brought their own meat with them. But Ben met up with her to find out some more. Well, what we've done is used uh, strontium isotopes which can trace the, the effect of soil composition and your diet to look at ancient migration patterns in humans and animals. So why is it that you can use strontium and the different isotopes available to actually find out where things have come from? Well, strontium basically comes from the rocks. And from the rocks, it gets into the plants and into the food chain. And the advantage of strontium is that it's basically linked to the, to the age of the underlying rocks. So in Britain, we have a huge diversity of rocks of different ages, and these all tend to give a different strontium isotope signal to the overlying biosphere. And uh, so we can pick this up and make use of it. And specifically, you've been using strontium isotope analysis for archaeological purposes. Whereabouts were you based? Well, we've done a lot of the work uh, in and around Stonehenge. And one of the great advantages of the Stonehenge area is that it's based on chalk, the chalky downs. And the chalk has a very distinctive isotope signature. So this gives us a chance to be quite clear about who and what has been raised on the chalk and who that we find buried in the chalk actually had to have come from somewhere else. And what have you been able to see? Right, well, in looking at human beings that have been buried around Stonehenge, we found, for instance, that Stone, um, Bronze Age Boscombe Bowmen, who are in a grave near Stonehenge, have clearly come from an area that's well away from, from Stonehenge and that they all moved during their childhood. So we've got the first definitive evidence of human migration from the human remains as opposed to extrapolating this from the artefacts that people find in the graves. So strontium isotope analysis is so powerful that you can actually plot how people have moved throughout the course of their life. Throughout their childhood, one of the restrictions for humans, not, not perhaps for animals, but for humans, is that our teeth form in childhood. And therefore, since it's the tooth enamel that we use, we are restricted to looking at where people were during their childhood. But that, in its own right, can be quite interesting. And so with animals, can you do the same sort of thing? With animals, their teeth form in a slightly different way, and uh, particularly with uh, grazing animals, their teeth are forming through to the animal's maturity. So you can actually track the history of the animal's grazing into a later period of its life relative to a human. So some of these animals that we've looked at do appear to have grazed in areas quite well distant from the chalk where they, their remains are found. So what do you think this says about the area where the remains were found? Was there something special that attracted people and their animals? Well, I, I think there are a number of things. I think the interesting thing about the animals first is that they're not all local. So first of all, we can immediately say we're not dealing with a small local feast. Neither are we dealing with a place where people come from far away, but animals and meat are supplied by local suppliers. We're looking at a situation where people are bringing animals from quite distant places and quite disparate places to this site. And by that very observation, it appears it must have significance and importance. And Durrington Walls itself is a huge site. So, yes, it must be that it has some meaning for these people and that these people from different parts of Britain are communicating and contacting each other and drawn by the same set of principles and desires to come to this place. 
So a technique of geological origin, looking at the strontium isotopes in rocks, allows us not only to use this as an extra tool for archaeology, but also to learn something about our social history. Yes, I, I find that the very attractive side of this, that you can go from a bunch of bones to Neolithic communication. So a technique from geology, crossing disciplines to tell us a story about Neolithic life in Britain. That was Jane Evans from the NERC Isotope Geosciences Lab in Nottingham. Thank you, Helen. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scuzz. We're talking about archaeology and what we can learn about our past and our possibly our future, you could say. But we've heard about how agriculture first got started and sometimes the land just isn't suitable and trying to farm it can cause it to change forever and it's suggested that this could be what happened to a group of people called the Nazca who were down in Peru. They're the people responsible for making those amazing Nazca lines which are carved pictures that you can see in the surface of the desert uh, including from the sky. If you fly over it it looks very striking. Now much of the area around where the Nazca lines now are is desert but it wasn't always like that. In fact it used to be very good farmland and it supported a very big population and it was rich in harango trees but the Nazca people and the harango trees now seem to have vanished and that happened at about 800 AD. So we sent our naked archaeologist, that's Diana O'Carroll, to meet Dr David Beresford-Jones to find out what happened. Well, Nazca was a culture which existed on the south coast of Peru, that's in the valleys of Nazca and, and Ica, from round about the time of Christ through to about 500 AD. It's famous now, of course, because of the Nazca lines, which thousands of tourists go to every year and fly over, which are giant geoglyphs etched on the surface of the desert pampa, which can only be seen from the air and give rise to all sorts of extraordinary theories about aliens, etc., etc. But the people who actually produced those lines, or most of them, were the Nazca people, who are the main subject of my interest. So what does the area look like today? It's the top end of the Atacama Desert. It's one of the oldest and driest deserts in the world. It never rains there. The only sources of water are the rivers which flow down off the Andes and then into the Pacific. So the oases along those rivers were where people lived and where these cultures flourished. What happened to Nazca culture? Why had they disappeared from the archaeological record by 800 AD? Well, Nazca culture, classic Nazca, if you like, we know about through a, a very beautiful art form which is expressed through their textiles and through their ceramics. It's an art form which paints a picture of, an, of the natural world and all those sort of fertility factors which underlie their agricultural production. That sort of rather conservative artistic canon, if you like, suddenly fractures into three completely different art styles which include themes of war, and warriors, increased depictions of head hunting around about the end of the classic Nazca period. There are fewer habitation sites and there's also evidence from human skeletons that human life expectancy was falling and infant mortality was rising. So this all adds up to a picture of uh, some major social change going on around about that time. So how did archaeologists explain this before? Well, the old explanation is a, an explanation which is generally applied to all culture change in the Andes, is that it was caused by an El Nino event. So the amount of rain which is deposited in the mountains from the Pacific Ocean goes up a huge amount and the rivers flood dramatically. My problem with it is that it rather paints a picture of cultures sitting there on the coast of Peru and every now and again being impacted by these big climatic events over which they have no control which isn't very satisfying from a point of view of what we know about human cultures worldwide anyway. What part does the huarango tree have to play in all this? The huarango is a tree from the genus of Prosopis, and it's the dominant tree species on the coast of Peru. I suppose that what I argue in, in my work is that its importance, although we can appreciate quite easily its importance as a human resource, its importance goes far beyond that because it is actually a keystone species in this particular called riparian, in other words, these oases along the rivers. Because it's leguminous, it fixes nitrogen into the soil, which improves soil quality through that and through a, a bunch of other effects. It has effects on soil moisture, it creates a different microclimate and modifies all these extremes of the desert environment to make it a more pleasant place for humans and, and indeed for other plants and animals. So if this tree was pretty essential in maintaining the soil, does that mean that Nazca culture went through such a dramatic change because they chopped too many down? That chopping down of the trees, a gradual process of human-induced change, then exposed the landscape 
to these El Nino events. So the El Nino events, in the absence of this gradual change, were not the great catastrophes at all. There were times when the water table was replenished and there were probably years of abundance. The reason people were chopping down this tree is, of course, increased agriculture in order to clear this woodland in order to have larger and larger fields. But the landscape essentially was unable to support that sort of agricultural production after a certain point in time. What lines of data did you have to follow to prove this? First of all, and rather obviously, there are a whole bunch of relic tree trunks scattered across the landscape, which is now completely empty of any vegetation whatsoever. So we can record the positions of those tree trunks and therefore record where woodland used to be, where it isn't anymore. Secondly, we can look at middens. Those are rubbish dumps where people have been disposing of their rubbish in the ancient past to see what they were eating. And that can give us a kind of proxy indicator for changed ecological conditions. And we can look at pollen. What we can see in those pollen records is a lot of Warango pollen at the bottom of the sequence, in other words, going down in time. And then as you go up the sequence, up the archaeological stratigraphy, if you like, and therefore forward in time, a gradual falling away of that warango and indeed of the other trees which make up that riparian woodland, acacia, etc. And agriculture signals appearing in that pollen record. Until we get up to the top of it, where we've got a signal which is completely dominated by chenopods and amaranths. Now, those are weeds, effectively weedy species, which grow in agricultural fields and are very tolerant of saline conditions. And that's the sort of signal we get right at the top before we eventually convert into a landscape as it is today, which is really, as I say, got no vegetation in it at all. I think there's a lesson in that for us all, isn't there? That was David Beresford-Jones, who's at Cambridge University, explaining to Diana O'Carroll why change in land use seems to have caused trouble for the Nazca people, and that eventually led to their demise. Bringing the facts to bear. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris and Helen. And now it's time to welcome Diana O'Carroll back into the studio for this week's Question of the Week. Hello, Diana. Hello, Helen. Well, this week I've been slaving over a hot stove to find you the answer to this one. Hi, this is Kathleen from Portland, Oregon in the United States. And I'm wondering why are humans the only animals who cook their meat? Does it give us an advantage against parasites or is it just cultural at this point? So who was the first head chef and why do we need them anyway? I'm Robert Foley. I'm Professor of Human Evolution at the University of Cambridge in the Leverhulm Centre for Human Evolutionary Studies. Cooking is certainly unique to humans. There's no other species that does it. There are obvious reasons for that because we're the only ones that can make fire, which is a prerequisite. So in a way, fire comes first and then cooking becomes a process after it. It's becoming clear that really cooking provides quite a number of advantages. Richard Wrangham from Harvard has been doing a lot of experiments looking at how cooking can change the nutritional value of food. And what it seems is that the process of warming food up, in a sense denaturing it, has a number of effects. One is the food is much more tender, and that we know. You eat a cooked carrot instead of a raw carrot, and it's much easier. So we can spend less time chewing, we can swallow it faster, and we can digest it faster. And it seems that, in one sense, it's an extension of things we see in other animals. So animals will use techniques often in their stomachs to tenderize food, things to try and make it more easily absorbable. If we turn to the other question of when all this happened, the real question there is, when do we first find evidence of fire? And that seems to be about half a million years or so ago. Now, we don't find direct evidence of cooking then, but we do see over the next 100,000 years or so, beginnings of things like burnt bone, which suggests that meat is cooked. And so it's probable that it goes quite a long way back in our evolutionary history. And some people would argue it's really a very major change in the way we are able to, to live and survive. But cooking can also affect how digestible food is. Hello, my name is Peter Lucas, and I'm a professor of anthropology at the George Washington University. Washington, D.C., in the USA. Now, there's a second possible advantage for cooking, is that it improves digestion. We've done a model study here, particularly with Jung Chuen Chui when she was here, and is now in the University of Purdue in the USA. And she found that, yes, cooking does, to some extent, improve digestion, but you only need to cook something for a fraction of the time of what you actually do in order for it to be digested properly. 
the cooking times that people adopt when they normally say this is cooked seem to reflect very strong mechanical changes in the food. In other words, these are things that affect your perception of food texture and allow you actually to eat it very much easier, very much shorter eating times than you would do if they're raw. And that, I think, is, the, is what I would give as an essential answer at the moment. So it looks like fire brought about those tender and juicy steaks. There's definitely an advantage to cooking. Apart from bug killing, you don't have to bother chewing for as long, as Professor Lucas argues. And this is why we get away with having wonky teeth, apparently. So there's also the idea that squishy cooked food can be good for weaning babies off milk when they don't have very many teeth. And on our forum... um JNA pointed out that ants actually make fruit fly soup using their own digestive enzymes. And RD mentioned that Japanese macaques not only wash their potatoes, but they season them in salty water. Mmm, delicious. So, from the animals of this planet to something totally out of this world. Hi, it's Jake from South Dakota, and I was wondering if a balloon filled with helium would float on the moon. So what would you do if you were planning a party on the moon? Let us know by emailing chris at thenakedscientist.com or by writing, on, writing it on our forum. That's thenakedscientist.com forward slash forum. Thank you, Diana. That's Diana O'Carroll with this week's Question of the Week. More Question of the Week, Tom Fullery, next week. Lifting the lab coat on the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales, and we're talking about the science of archaeology this week. Time to trip back now to the Middle Ages. Helen. Yes, we left Ben and Dave constructing a medieval siege weapon out of a few things lying around the office. So let's go and see if they really are capable of siege of waging desktop warfare. Welcome back to Kitchen Science, where today we're building our own desktop version of a medieval siege weapon. Earlier on, we built ourselves a trebuchet. This is basically like a seesaw, but with the pivot much closer to one side than the other. On the short side, we've put a big heavy weight, in our case a cup, and on the long side is where we're going to put our projectile. Now, we've actually just got a pen lid on a piece of string, because we don't want to throw anything dangerous. Dave, are we ready to fire? I think we're ready to fire. It's probably not going to knock down any castle walls, but it could be quite cool anyway. Fantastic. So let's get this loaded up. We once again put the piece of string that's attached to our projectile onto the little hook that we've put at the long end of the trebuchet. And now Dave's just going to pull it back. And what that's done is lifted up our weight, the cup, on the other end. I'm going to stand back. Dave's going to let go, I think, and we'll see how far it flies. When you're ready, Dave. OK, here we go. That's incredible. Now, despite this only being a 20-centimetre-long piece of cardboard, a pen and a few bits of string, that fired all the way across the room and hit a desk at the far end. But, Dave, even when I was much, much heavier than the person on the other end of the seesaw, I never sent them flying across the park. How come this works in this setup? The basic principle is exactly the same as the seesaw. When the mug goes downwards, the other end of the arm goes upwards. However, because the side of the arm which the mug's attached to is very short and the other end is very long, when the mug drops about 5 centimetres, this end comes upwards about 25 centimetres. So the length of the arm actually acts to multiply the amount of movement and so the speed at which the end goes. Yeah, that's right. It's exactly the same as a crowbar, but in reverse. With a crowbar, what you're doing is taking a very large distance but small force from your hand, taking it to a very small distance but very large force to rip things apart. And now this is working in reverse. You've got a very large force moving a small distance from the mug, which is transferred into a small force moving a large distance at the other end of the arm. OK, so I see how the distance from the pivot acts to multiply the speed at which it's dropping. But the mug is dropping down, so the other end of the arm must be going up, but it threw our projectile forwards. How does this work? Well, because the mug's acting to rotate this arm, by the time the mug gets to the bottom of its drop, then the arm is going to be going sideways. Because the arm is attached to the projectile by a piece of string, it does two things to it. It both moves it at the same sort of speed as the end of the arm is moving, and it acts to rotate it around the end of that arm. So when the mug gets to the bottom of its drop, the arm is going to be moving at its fastest because it's gained the most energy from that cup dropping. But at this point, the piece of string is still rotating around the top of it. So the projectile actually ends up going faster than the end of the arm. So having a piece of string between our projectile and the rigid end of our seesaw arm of the trebuchet actually acts to increase the speed that it goes by putting sort of an extra flick in when the arm actually stops moving. It's the same principle as how a slingshot works. Basically, you have a piece of string attached to your arm. 
So that extra flick means that the stone in the end of the slingshot can go much faster than the end of your hand is moving, and so it can go much further and be much more lethal. Yeah. So a trebuchet, which actually seems like a pretty basic bit of technology, is based on something even more basic, just a slingshot. And in fact, that's how they were developed. The first thing that people started doing was attaching their slings to a pole because then the end of the pole can be going really quite fast and that sling on the end of that makes it going even faster so you get quite a lethal weapon. Then they decided they wanted to throw heavier things so they pivoted a pole with lots of people pulling down on one end put a heavy rock at the other end so you get like 50 or 100 people pulling down at one end of the pole the other end would fly upwards and launch rocks out of castle walls again this is called a traction trebuchet. Well that doesn't sound like a fun thing to do what if it went wrong and the rock fell on you? I don't think they worried about that sort of thing in those days. <laughs> Health and safety wasn't quite as developed as it is now. And then basically someone came up with a bright idea of using a heavy weight instead of 100 people, as it was probably cheaper. And also meant that the trebuchet was much more accurate because you could lift the weight a certain distance and give the rock a very prescribed amount of energy so you could predict where it was going to go again and again and again. And so you could keep hitting the same piece of the wall and then knock it down. And that's basically what the trebuchet we have in front of us is. Fantastic. Well, please go on our website at thenakedscientist.com slash kitchen science, where Dave is going to put some video and instructions to how to make your own desktop trebuchet. If you are going to make one, do be careful because it does fling things really quite quickly and actually quite far, but it's an awful lot of fun to play with. So that's all we have for this medieval siege weapon kitchen science. We'll be back with another great hands-on experiment next week. Thanks, guys. So that um, weapon may not be powerful enough to knock down castle walls, but you can certainly build a mini trebuchet that works well enough to fire across rooms and like they said they're going to put some videos up on the net for you so have a look at www.thenakedscientist.com forward slash kitchen science and you can scale it up so that you can take out the neighbor's fence if you really don't like them only joking this is the naked scientist with chris and helen and we're talking about the science of archaeology this week preston miracle is with us from Cambridge university preston got a question here from david khan who says how does radiocarbon dating work well, it works because you have uh, carbon-14, which is a heavier form of carbon-12, uh, formed in the upper atmosphere from the bombardment of the carbon by cosmic rays or other bits of radiation. Uh, we know how much of that is being formed today, and therefore by looking at the ratio of the carbon-14 to the carbon-12 in anything that was taking the carbon in, so any kind of plant or animal, um, that was living in the past, you can measure the ratio of how much of that carbon-14 is still left and by that way infer how long it has been dead um, since, since that carbon-14 has decayed. Because it stops taking the radioactive form in the minute it dies. Therefore, the amount of radioactive carbon in it must start to decline after death and therefore working out how much is in there tells you when it died, how long ago, because we know how long the carbon takes to, to disappear. Exactly. Jim Geating's been in touch and he wants to know, um, perhaps a question here for Martin, how did early civilizations learn the language of their neighbours? Well, one thing we know is that as farmers spread, probably languages spread with them. You can do a family tree of languages and a family tree of genes and there's a reasonable match. But we also know that there was a contact between hunter-gatherers and farmers and so there would have been a, a interaction between people with diff very different languages and I guess we must just assume their body languages were sending the right messages. And also their, their tummy telling them they're hungry so they'd be willing to communicate to swap food and things in order to get what they wanted and that meant co cooperation and that meant the opportunity to exchange language. That's right and I think there were more multilingual communities now than in the English speaking world we imagine there were. Thank you, Martin. Well, that's it for this week, but I do have some very exciting news for you, which is that the Naked Scientists have won the Population Institute's Global Media Award for Best Radio Show. And as a result, we're off to L.A. and San Diego next week to pick up the trophy. So, since we're going there, we thought we'd offer anyone in the immediate environs the opportunity to come and have a meet-up with us and join us for a beer. So we'll actually be at the Naked Cafe which is on the web at thenakedcafe.com, and that's at 106 South Sierra Avenue, Solana Beach. We'll be there on Saturday the 22nd of November from 2pm, so do drop by and say hello if you're in the area. In the meantime, thank you very much to this week's guests, Preston Miracle, Martin Jones, Jane Evans and David Beresford-Jones, and also to our production team, Ben Valsler, Mira Senthalingam, Dave Ansell, Diana O'Carroll and Tom Simpkins. Next week, it's our science phone-in special, so send your science questions on anything to chris at thenakedscientist.com. Have a great week and thanks for listening. Goodbye. 
The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com.